Now for today's little video, we've taken a little trip nearby to where I live in Derbyshire. We're in the high peak and in traditional high peak weather, it is absolutely booking it down with rain, which is nothing new for this time of the year in November. And you may wonder why we're here when most of our videos are concerning heritage railways or heritage railway signaling. Well, this very loosely fits in with today's topic. I'm here at the Bugsworth Basin in Derbyshire, which was a canal interchange from the Peak Forest Tramway to the Peak Forest Canal Company. Now, Peak Forest Canal Company, which its line goes all the way from Manchester to Whaley Bridge, built a branch up here to Bugsworth with the inevitable plan to go eastwards from here up the hills there towards the east to the quarries at Dove Holes, descending a few hundred feet in the process. However, it was decided that due to the terrain and the inclines that would be needed, the locks, etc., and the water supply problems of feeding those locks, that they would instead build a tramway system. And part of that tramway system still survives here all around the Bugsworth Basin, which is quite a large complex, as you can see. And you may notice the ruts that are in front of us there in the ground. And those used to hold the plateway, which was an early form of tramway, based on the uh, tramways around the Derby area. And that went off eastwards up the hills there towards uh, Whitehall for Chapel on the Frith, which was the capital of the High Peak at the time, and also off into the quarries at Dove Holes, some four, four or five miles to the east of us. Now, one of the problems, obviously, as I've mentioned, is the terrain around here. As you can see, hills occur very, very quickly in the area. We have the hills at the back of the bridge just behind us there. And whilst the canal and the railway could navigate some of these problems, once it got to Chapel on the Frith, they faced one major problem, and that was the incline up the hill of what we call the plane, spelt P-L-A-N-E. And the incline plane there, uh, it was decided that the tramway would negotiate a vertical climb of nearly half a mile um, in length and some two to three hundred feet in elevation. And that would be done using a winch system where loaded wagons going down would haul empty wagons on the return journey. It's all downhill to Bugsworth Basin. And the subject of this video is to look at the control measures that were put in place for that, for what we could call one of the earliest signal boxes in the country, because technically it did control the signal and it did control the wagons going up and down the plane. And we'll have a look at some of the wagons, some of the control systems and general area as such. Now, obviously, the last movement on the railway happened in 31st of July, July 1925. And that was a long time ago, it's over 100 years. So we're not going to see much evidence of what was left there. However, there are some photographs that give us some kind of a, a story as to what there was there at the time, what controlled the wagons up and down the inclined plane. And we'll have a look at that as we go along. Now, just one other little thing while we're down at Bugsworth, sheltering from the rain. Let's have a look at this small motif relief here, of the actual Bugsworth Basin as it was. This model here shows us the incoming lines coming in from Chapel on the Frith and Whitehoff at this end here. And the main route as we are here, we're actually at this location just here on top of this bridge, as you can see just here. And then the wagons would be discharged into various unloading methods that would then drop into the canal boats and be taken away to Manchester, North West and beyond. So let's take a journey up to Chapel in the Frith and have a look at the incline plane. Now before we get too far into the video, we need to explain exactly what was the purpose of the incline plane and what did it do. The incline plane controlled the wagons, descent and ascent up and down the incline at Chapel on the Frith to get back to the quarries at the Holt. Now here's one of the replica wagons on display down at Buxworth Basin. As we can see, cast or iron or steel construction, wooden underframe and cast iron wheels, around about 20 inches in diameter. Very simple in construction, wheels were pegged on, this cotter pin on the end, and one of these could carry between three quarters of a ton and a ton and a half of uh, weight themselves, but also they could carry up to two and a half tons of rock. So eight wagons in a train could carry somewhere between 24 to 28 tons. And that would be pulled down the plane and the empties hauled back up. 
Control of the wagons themselves was usually applied by a person called a hanger-on, who would literally hang on the side of the wagon and apply brakes using a braking stick as the wagons went down inclines or descended down into the Pugsworth Basin from the upper levels in the Devolves and Chapel and the Frith areas. And this chapter called the Hanger-on. It was also known that in certain circumstances water could be applied to the wheels to lubricate them, however this was not normally done. And here in this display picture, which you can see here at Bugsworth Basin, you can see there's quite a few wagons there in a train going down the hill. Front wagon here, he's got his tub of water, so he can apply that. And remember, each one of these is roughly holding, say, two, two and a quarter, two and a half tonnes as a whole. So there's about 30, 40 tonnes there, a few extras at the back. As I mentioned, the inclined plane would control the ascent and descent of these wagons. So at the top of the plane, groups of men would attach a rake of eight wagons fully loaded together and these would then be hooked to a chain attached to the rear. Now this is just a demonstration example so it doesn't have that. That hooking chain would then be hooked off onto the chain or rope going up and down the plane, the inclined plane and tied off with leather straps, much the same way that the Crottenford High Peak uh, attain the same for their railway wagons. And that would then allow some bite onto the chain or rope. So as the wagons descended, they would grip that chain rope going down. The full laden wagons on the way down would obviously pull up a rake of empty wagons on the way up, thereby a good use of kinetic energy, ensuring that nothing was wasted. What we have here on the side of these are some places where you can see where the brake sticks were applied. And as you can imagine, it would be a pretty nefarious affair to do this. Uh, so the hanger-on was uh, a very brave person. The tramway itself was constructed very simply off these stone sleeper blocks with cast iron uh, holding plates and L-section plates not rails as such, these are called plates, hence it's a plate way. And these would be held in place with steel or cast iron pins sat down into wooden plugs into the actual stone sleepers. Much like a modern railway, except that here we have the early days of rail technology with stone sleepers and plate rails. The sections of plate way themselves were constructed at the Gorton Works in Manchester. I'm here at Marple Locks, just a few miles further down towards Manchester than Bugsworth, and I'm here for a reason. When we consider how the tramway was built up the inclined plane, we need to understand why it was built up the inclined plane. Now, we'll look at a little bit of the geography of that very soon, you'll realise why. But we're here at Marple Locks, and I just want to show you something. Up there is Bugsworth. Down there is Ashton and Manchester. This is a flight of 16 locks that covers some 209 feet in elevation, going over one mile, uh, 1.6 kilometres in length. And the Peak Forest Canal Company built this to get over the small problem of going up 200 odd feet. Now, as you can appreciate, it's built over a mile in length. You don't have that ability at Chapel and Frith to do that. There is one place you could have built it through Bar Clough, but we'll get into that later. But here, to get around this problem, they built 16 locks to get the same height, roughly, up the hills to get to the quarries. That's 16 locks worth of engineering. I mean, just, there's a butty boat here with a brand new lock gate to replace it. Now, the historical sources I've referenced to look at this video mentions that between 1796 and 1804, these canal locks weren't completed, there wasn't the money to build them. So instead, they actually built another tramway here to connect the bottom to the top locks. So the canal was disjointed, but to get around that problem, they had to build another tramway. And again, that would have to be an incline. Now, that's the first time in 40 odd years I've heard about this. So, was this another inclined plane for the Brakeman's Tower and some control system? It seems too steep to have been horse worked. 
who knows? But you can see the problems now when they reach Chapel and the Frith, it multiplies in height. So this small engineering feature that they'd already conquered, they then had to conquer again. So second time round, they decided, no, we'll build the tramway, not the locks. It makes more logical sense. If you look at the, uh, this lock here, number lock number seven, you can appreciate the engineering features required to get this kind of waterway up to 300 feet in the air. And that's about 10 meters. And that's just the first lock of 16. So there we are at Temple the Frith and looking out across the beautiful Peak District. It's a high peak. What I want to show you is just over there, if you can just make out Chinley Viaducts, the Midland Railway Viaducts. This is the head of the valley here, the Chapel of the Frith, and all the railways here that came later after the Peak Forest Tramway all ended up in this one spot here, found various ways through the Peak District. The middle of the line has its tunnel, through Carburn Tunnel, just under there. In fact, you can just make out there the uh, first air shaft of the tunnel. And again, the other Midland route over Chinley Viaducts cuts through there, through Chapel and Frith Central, and then it's on to the tunnels, and over to Buxton, and down to uh, Millersdale, Rosley, and Matlock, and down to Derby. This wall you see behind us here is the top of the plane incline, and as you can see, it's quite a formidable bit of dry stone walling. That there's the top of the plane. The building is now occupied up there were the stables and the workshops for the uh, Peak Forest Tramway. Again, all this is now private property, but we'll have a look from the top of the plane looking down in a bit. There's a public footpath just there we can see. Right down there at the town end, you can just make out, just down there, that's the uh, town end of the bottom of the plane. Now, as I mentioned, why did they build the inclined plane? Well, if they'd continued the canal up to this point here, Chaplin Frist Town End, that's not too bad. It's reasonably flat, a few locks to get you up to here. Once you get to here, the only real way to get to the quarries of Holes is to avoid these hills entirely, which go all the way round, by the way, down to Coombs, so a good few miles. And that's to use this cutting up here through Barmer Clough, where the Chapel Bypass now flows. And that disappears off there into Barmer Clough cutting. The river naturally cut that over centuries, and that takes you just about a mile that way, brings you out to the side at Barmer. And that would actually get you the easiest way to get through um, the, the hill there. However, it would mean starting locks all the way down there in Chapel, go all the way up where the bypass now flows. So you can imagine it would be more of an undertaking than the locks at Marple. And as such, it would cost a lot more. Could you have built an inclined plane there? Well, very possible. However, if we look, we notice that just about here, where you actually go into the cutting, uh, for another half mile that way, it curves round. You have no sighting at all. So if you put some form of uh, an incline in there that was rope worked, where wagons descending would pull the wagons up, then it would be out of sight. Uh, secondly, the length of the rope or chain would be enormous, adding to the weight of uh, all the extra equipment you need. And you'd have probably ended up with uh, very serious control problems getting that to work. So as such, it was far easier to bite the bullet bring the tramway to the bottom of the hill there, town end, and just come straight up the most shortest route to the top of the hill. And once you reach the top of the hill here, at the top of the plane, it's relatively flat back down into dove holes. We're at the top of the plane now, and it's not that easy to actually see the uh, kind of scale of where we are at the moment. This is where we were before in the field, just down there. And we're at the top of the plane here. Now, bear in mind, the tramway was opened in 1796, and the surveyors were Benjamin Outram, um, but there was also another engineer, Thomas Brown. Now, Thomas Brown was directly related to the surveying of the actual plane itself. And he was very clever in what he did. The gradient at the bottom is one in eight and a quarter. The gradient at the top is one in six and a quarter. And it's listed that it had two purposes for doing this. The first was to reduce the action of wagons going up over the top, so it slowed them down effectively, just as they were coming to the top. 
and the second it balanced the weight of the chain and the wagons going down. Remember I mentioned that they sent them down in teams of eight, uh, pulling empties up, so you'd have to balance them up. The top of the plane itself, the buildings behind me, they had three sets of stop blocks to ensure that nothing rolled away until it was actually needed. The actual brakeman's foot at the top sat about um, 18 foot up, so we had a great view looking down the plane. Now I'm six foot high, and if you can imagine just about three times my height, I'd be able to see all the way down there, right to the bottom, the town end down there. And down there was the disc and bell signal, and that was operated by the staff at the bottom when they were ready to commence the descending ascending operations. And that was a red disc, white disc, which would be turned so that the guy at the top of the plane could see that. And we've got a great view here, you can see it. And on misty days, they had a bell to work as well. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether that would have actually worked, because looking up here now, I, I can hear all the traffic of the bypass, but I can't hear anything from down below in town. The uh, brakeman's foot itself also had a pulley block, which was uh, attached to a lever that was about 15 foot long. So not only had you got all the action off the 15 foot lever, but we also had the pulley as well to give it even more weight. And originally when it was opened here in 1970-96, it was a hemp rope, which was soon replaced with a, a chain, and that was soon uh, replaced with another chain with lengths of five inches. And that was made in Birmingham at a cost of 500 pounds, quite a lot of money in them days. Uh, records again suggest that about 1817 and 1831, the chain was replaced again, so it was obviously getting worn. Um, and the chain at the time cost, well, weighed around five tonnes. It was guided initially by wooden rollers, but as these wore out, it was decided to put uh, steel rollers in. By that time, production of steel had got a lot easier to make, and it reduced the, uh, the friction as well. The brakeman's foot itself had a, uh, a big drum where the uh, rope went around one and a half times and then had a band break on the outside of that, which was wood and the band break was designed so that the grain of the wood would actually bite into the rope or chain. Um, so it's been some clever design in that. Uh, again, the top of the plane is about 209 feet above town end, and as we mentioned, the empty wagons were pulled up by the full wagons going down. So you'd have a, guy, a bunch of guys at the bottom there, making sure that you could drop the wagons off, and a bunch of guys at the top who would hook them onto the actual uh, rope itself and how that was done was very similar to the Confin High Peak Railway where you tied smaller chains around the bigger chain to start with almost like a plait and then tie that off with smaller bands as well at the end so it bites into the rope and a nice little touch here the new owners of the top of the plane have actually managed to save one of the um, two sets of track beds in their little garden which is quite nice and those are the stone sleepers going to the top of the plane that was just behind us so that's quite a nice little trip. Uh, the tramway itself was double track throughout, except for two small portions. The first small portion you can't really see is just on the town end road bridge there. We'll get a shot of that later, um, where it goes to single track. And then the other shot, just out of uh, sight, you can't really see again, Stoddart Tunnel, uh, which is on the English Heritage's third oldest railway tunnel in the UK. Um, that's, that was single track as well. Um, used to play in that as we were kids ironically and for many years it was part of a test track for Frodo who uh, make brake linings. So today what can you see? Not much, it's uh, mostly abandoned on the plane. One of the things we did discover as we were kids and I now realise what it was, we used to call it a uh, tombstone. Just halfway down is a mile post. Um, again like most modern railways you have mile posts and gradient posts. The early days of Peak Forest Tramway they actually had mile posts. A uh, 10 mile post, as we saw earlier, was at lock number 7 down at Marple Locks. And there's another mile post here, I can't remember what it is now, mile post 17 or something. And that sits there and that is listed on their documents. Uh, so again, you, you can, can't really appreciate the distance here, but again, 209 feet in elevation, it's quite. This is Town End, and you would never know the uh, tramway was here now. This is what's left of the old bridge on one side of the road where Street Crane occupies the factory now that was where that picture we saw of the hanger on her at uh, Bugsworth 
basin was uh, was shot. So camera room was down there somewhere near that where that white tent was. But you'd never know top of the plane, uh, bottom of the plane, sorry, was here anymore. It's all been built on this side of the road now. There's houses both sides.